Welcome to the Homeschool Together podcast. Where one working mom and a stay-at-home dad help you navigate the nuts and bolts of the growing and dynamic world of homeschooling. With a focus on early learners. Like me! All the ins and outs of building and maintaining your homeschool life. Homeschool! Find out tips and tricks to make things like this easier. I'm reading! And ultimately, enjoy educating your kids. And what's that last thing? Have fun together! Did I do good, Daddy? (laughs) Yeah, you did, sweetie. Good job. Hello and welcome to Homeschool Together. We have a really wonderful interview, but before we begin, if you could head down into the show notes, leave us a review. We're sitting at 25 and we have a little challenge. Let's get us to 30. <laughs> and you right now could be that one, that yeah, one person. We appreciate person. it. This <laughs> is how people find us when they're looking on Absolutely. Apple and they're like, are these people any good? If you listen to the show every week, we would love for you to just yeah, give a, a quick Take review. a moment. It only takes about 30 seconds and it would be really helpful for us. Awesome. Also, we have all the links from today's interview in the show notes as well. There's a lot of great content. So we talked to psychologist, superstar, <laughs> uh, game aficionado, uh, Brian, Dr. Brian McDonald. Yeah, he was, he was amazing. I felt like it was like free. It was like free advice. He was, was. wonderful. We, and- we, we owe him a, con- a consult. At least, yeah, we'll, we'll Venmo him as we said. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, he he's fantastic. We talked with Dr. Brian about he works with kids assessing their uh, learning difficulties mm-hmm. and trying to help families come up with strategies to um, to overcome those difficulties and and grow their relationship. And we talked with him specifically from a homeschool standpoint about how can we as parents. Uh, identify when our kids might be having a, a larger issue and what are some what are some steps that we can take to try to to suss out what that is with you know before we need to go to a psychologist what yeah what you know what can we also mindset as well mindset how yeah. can we how can we try to figure out what's going on you know are, for your learners just continually struggling with something yeah how do you tell the difference between that being a normal struggle and maybe yeah. they have a learning difficulty or or there's another um, emotional issue emotional going on yeah. that, that you don't really realize? This was this was one of my hands down favorite interviews. Well, and, and Dr. Brian's really good. Um, he runs a YouTube channel as well. Um, and he just he, he is very confident. You know, he's been doing this for a long time. I think in the interview years. he said for about 20 years. So he's very knowledgeable. He's seen a lot of kids. And I think he presents the information, you know, that's around a challenging subject in a very clear and thoughtful manner. And I mm-hmm. think everybody's going to really, I think everybody's going to get something, you know, even if it's small out of this interview. Right. I think it's great to listen to this because even if you're not having, um, if there's not any issue that you're struggling with right now or that your learner might be struggling with, this is great information to, for us to keep yeah. into the back of our mind of I'm going to be on the lookout for this. And definitely he gave me some just amazing food for thought about maybe how yeah. to talk to our daughter uh, a little bit, try to Empathize, get information yeah. from him, from her about, about what's going on, how she really feels um, yep. in, in our homeschool. So it was fantastic. And Dr. Brian runs Brains on Games, which is a YouTube channel where he, he specifically uses tabletop board games, uh, you know, as, as we love, um, to help families connect and to help kids uh, overcome some challenges and get, you know, specific practice using games in an educational sense to, to help them work on things that might be challenging for them. So that's how we met Dr. Brian. Mm-hmm. He's a member of the Game School Co-op, which if you haven't checked out, it's a wonderful group of content creators that uh, we're a part of um, that all use games for education and just have amazing resources. So we're going to try to be getting each of them on the podcast um you know, through this year because they all bring such amazing different perspectives. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I absolutely love this interview. Mm-hmm. It was wonderful. So hopefully you guys enjoyed it as well. So Dr. Brian McDonald from Brains on Games. Hi, Dr. Brian. Thank you so much for joining us today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. So can you give us a bit of background about yourself and, and your practice and how you're helping kids? Sure. Uh, well, I am well, a father of two kids who are now young adults. One is 18 and one is 20 years old now, but 
Uh, I have for 20 years been a psychologist who has worked in treatment centers and schools and private practice, uh, supporting families of kids who are having uh, mental health difficulties or learning challenges and uh, supporting kids, especially with their uh, education at school. So what type of things do you do to kind of uh, assess kids who are you know struggling with learning difficulties and maybe a little bit of mental health. I know we're, we're all going through a lot of mental health uh, challenges here for the last two years, you know, mm-hmm. big things happening, you know, stuff like that. So, you know, what, what are the type of things do you look for that can help maybe us as parents, you know, l- you know, key in on as well? I mean, it has been super challenging in the, in the past yeah. couple of years, right? <laughs> it's hard. It's hard to know what is related to all the changes and uncertainty and, and what, kind of came before in the before times. So in, in my work, uh, when I first started, well, when I was doing my training, I was, I, I was working, uh, to become a couples therapist and, and to do marriage counseling. But, uh, as soon as uh, someone set me up in, uh, a tra- a training setting where I was working with teenagers, my, my treatment group, my clientele became younger and younger after that. I just really, really enjoyed working with kids. And so when we do assessments, usually I'll do, and it it probably varies by psychologist and it certainly varies by jurisdiction, but usually I start with an interview. Uh, If we're talking about a teenager, then the the teenager, of course, would participate in that. Uh, And sometimes the parents, if the kids are younger, then the parents are always the ones that I talk to. If I'm lucky, I get information from a teacher as well. Sometimes more than one teacher. When I was working in the school board, of course, I had access to all the teachers and all of the files, so I could do a review of the files. I do ask parents to send copies of report cards and things like that, so that I can see what's going on in terms of learning. Uh, and the interview does focus on s- sort of functioning in different settings, whether it's uh, functioning at school and academic background, health history and medical history and family background. Um, I do uh, interviews about social functioning and behavior and friendships and things like that. I'll have kids and parents and teachers fill out questionnaires so that I can find out, you know, compared to hundreds of other kids the same age as yours, you know, does does this child have more trouble with attention or anxiety or mood than 99% of other boys or girls the same age? Uh, if if there are learning problems that are being assessed, then I, I spend, usually I spend the day with a child or a teenager or a young adult, and we do lots of activities that look at various skills related to learning and academic functioning. So we'll do tests of verbal problem solving skills, visual skills, spatial ability, motor skills in terms of accurate handwriting and pencil control, how quickly kids can process information, how how well they remember information, uh, and their reading and writing and math skills. So we, we spend uh, the better part of a day together. And then I put all of those results together into a report. Uh, I write everything out for the family and, and for teachers to work from with diagnoses, if, if the, a diagnosis makes sense, and some recommendations for things that can be done to sort of help that student to reach his or her potential. Do you see a lot of different types of issues like maybe like I, I know with our podcast we tend to uh, skew younger so say mm-hmm. sub sixth grade or maybe under 10 years old and we there's obviously some parents who are listening to have older kids but we tend to skew that direction are there different types of issues you, you see with younger kids versus older kids is there kind of a the same problems all the way through well um i i think that there there's if if there is a learning problem that sometimes older students are more frustrated or maybe confused about like, why can't I do this? Why am I having this? You know, I should be, how come my friends find this so easy? Why does it take me three hours to do my homework? So the older kids maybe are a bit more possibly reflective on, on the problems that they might be having. They might, maybe they have some insight, maybe they're, they're confused and stressed about what's going on. Um, I am seeing across the board, lots of uh, anxiety related issues and attention tend to be the two big things and sometimes one is confused for the other. Okay. Um, do you, do you in your practice or maybe, maybe us as, you know, amateur parents, um, you're, you're a pro parent, you've got your pro parent card. Um, <laughs> Make sure you tell my kids that. 
<laughs> well, when they go out into the world, I, I, don't you get a receipt from like the government saying like, you, congratulations, thank you. <laughs> no, the, the, um, you, you tend to have like in any discipline, there's theories and there's, there's ways that things are done. Do you follow a certain, you know, philosophy within the psychology wing or do you do you recommend to as for parents to look for certain types of you know I, I maybe it's a bad analogy but like I don't want to send my kid to you know a an orthopedic surgeon when they've got a kidney problem right like like right. do you have different types of should we be looking for certain types of doctors certain types of disciplines well uh, I I do think that if you're having a, a child assessed for school related problems that it is helpful if the doctor who's doing the testing is is sort of in the know uh, about okay. how the school system operates, and that wouldn't be the case for every single psychologist who works with kids, although you know many of us who work with kids would would sort of have had some contact with uh, with a, a school setting or a school board. In uh, what you'll find that you get. Uh, if a if a medical doctor or a teacher is recommending some sort of treatment for a child, is often you'll get recommendations for, or you'll do some research and and think that maybe a, a cognitive behavioral therapy would be the way to go. So finding a psychologist who does that kind of work might be something that uh, would be recommended to people. That's not the the way that I work for for a number of reasons. Um, I I do more family therapy, of, of course, because I work with kids and parents. Uh, but my approach is one that's more developmental, which, which follows a philosophy of, uh, you know, without seeking expert help or support uh, in, in the right setting, in the right circumstances, kids will develop into productive, mature adults. And if there's a problem that's interfering with that, you look for the obstacles that prevent the natural development from occurring instead of teaching kids to do something or behave in a different way or uh, teaching parents to, to uh, train their kids to, you know, ignore how they feel or develop all kinds of strategies to, to deal with emotional reactivity. Instead, it's more about removing obstacles that would prevent the natural process of maturity from developing that would allow them to figure out how to do that on their own. So it's more of a child focus, like <clears throat> allowing them, giving them the tools they need to succeed, you know, by themselves, as opposed to having people direct them. Well, I wouldn't say that. I would say that it's, it's a, it's a, my approach is one that would sort of believe that kids don't, don't need strategies necessarily, but that those, okay. that their coping skills and self-regulation skills and self-discipline uh, can develop naturally if, this, if the circumstances are right. And so it's more about helping families to create relationships and create an environment where the natural process can occur rather Got than it. saying, okay. okay, you do it this way, this way, this way. Here's 10 steps, uh, parents, for how to get your kids to go to bed on time. It's not usually like that, or I try not to make it like that uh, <laughs> it, it, because every kid is different and every parent is different. And that means every single relationship is going to be different. So it's about finding ways to uh, create some security that can allow the, uh, the emotional development to drive everything else. So I'm more focused on emotions than thoughts. I do feel like uh, when, when you're working with kids, if you're trying to train them to be logical and organized and to think ahead and to imagine distant consequences, you're probably barking up the wrong tree. They can, they can <laughs> learn, they can, they can parrot those things that you tell them. They can learn all of the rules and you can teach them the strategies to use when they're stressed or frustrated. But very often, once they're stressed or frustrated, all of those skills go out the window and they forget them and they can't use them for our listeners and, and ourselves as homeschooling parents, you know, we're the primary educators. So it, it, we would be, you know, you're, you're talking about uh, parents who have a, a teacher saying, Hey, we, we think you should see somebody. There's an issue in our case. It's us mm -hmm. who would have to do that assessment. And 
I, how, Mm -hmm. how would we know the difference between, you know, my child is struggling with this because it's just, it's a challenging subject for him or her and they need to persevere through it. Or maybe that's not the best curriculum choice. Maybe that doesn't, you know, work with their learning style. How do we, how do we know it's not a normal issue and it's something that we need to seek additional help for? What what are some of those like uh, clues or, or, or guides that, you know, maybe something else bigger might be going on? Uh, well, I, I think that your recognition, if the child is becoming frustrated, is huge. You know, if, if you're working with, uh, you, you, and the bonus for parents who are homeschooling their kids is that they know the kids so well. So <laughs> number one, you sh- you'll have an idea that, oh, I feel like they should be able to do this, but there's something blocking it, like what's getting in the way, you know, you know what their skill level is. And, and, and there's a notion that, this, this should be within their grasp with scaffolding or what have you, but there's something that's, that's not allowing them to do it. You might see big discrepancies in performance between one subject and another, where you might say, well, why, he's so great at reading or writing, but why is math so challenging? Or they're so great at math, but why, how can they get so upset when I ask them to write something down or put something on paper? Why is spelling taking so, so long to develop? So if you, if you feel that there's a, that the child's potential is there, but something's preventing them from reaching that potential. If you see that the child is becoming frustrated or discouraged, that's huge. That's probably the number one thing that I would say would, would uh, uh, be an indicator that some sort of assessment might be helpful. If you, if you're seeing huge discrepancies in skill development where they're lagging behind in one area, but they're jumping ahead in others, that might be an indicator that there's something worth looking into in more detail. You know, obviously there are, there are learning challenges that are something that we would be diagnosed and we could work with, you know, dyslexia, dysgraphia, things like that. What can we do for, for things that are, are not, that are more maybe environment-based or relationship-based with us and our children? Are there, are there things we can do to look at early warning signs and, and head it off at the past before it becomes a, a problem that's been going on for a mm-hmm. year in, you know, are there steps that we can take, you know, having focused conversations with our kids or, you know, what kind of ways have you found to help kids open up and maybe we can get to the point before they have a major problem that we can stop it when it's a small work, workable issue within the family. Hmm. Well, I th- a few things commonly get recommended, at least in my office. Uh, <laughs> one, one would be to, to really incorporate play where you can uh, in, in your day-to-day routines. You want to be playing with your kids and having fun with them because that helps them to feel comfortable when something's not going right. They feel close to you if, if you're engaged with them in play as well and things, things come out that maybe wouldn't, wouldn't come out otherwise. Uh, it's especially if kids are having problems in some area, I, I think it's really important for parents to find ways to, to find the joy in being with their kids when they're having some trouble, because sometimes it's stressful for the parents or it's, you know, there's behaviors that are hard to deal with. And uh, you may find yourself on edge sort of waiting for something bad to happen. So you do need to, to incorporate play to, to kind of offset that or balance that out. Uh, I, I think that relationship security, security is key that it would probably be the number one priority is ensuring that your kids feel safe and comfortable and secure and that they trust that you're there for them, that they're a priority for you, that they're, uh, significant and that they're cared for. And that's not something that they have to worry about that their, uh, parents are, are, are there to provide comfort and that comfort doesn't necessarily have to be pursued that it's always available when it's needed and that maybe the parents know when it's needed even before the kids do if your kids feel like you know them better than they know themselves that is a good sign that things are are going to proceed in the right direction Uh, one area that sometimes parents have trouble with is being able to take the lead and take an alpha role with with their kids being in the lead is, is really important for kids to feel comfortable that, that things are going to be taken care of and that they're, that they're okay. And that can allow them to 
sort of relax and have quiet time then that and that quiet time allows so many things to develop that uh, that wouldn't if they're distracted by screens or or if they're constantly engaged in activities you know kids need to be able to be bored sometimes and deal with having some quiet time and being alone with their thoughts but it's so hard for them to do that if they feel that something might not be okay that that the people around them don't know them well enough or don't know what's what the problems might be or how to deal with the problems they need to have that confidence and that means uh, the the parent taking taking the lead and, and sort of showing that they're they're in charge and and that they know what they're doing which is so hard now in the age of internet and and cell phones where the kids know more about those things than we do and they're quicker to ask Alexa a question uh, for an answer to a question than they are to ask their parents how do you take the lead when the kids have all the world's knowledge right at their fingertips all the time so so uh, you said a lot there and I just want to key on a couple things the the idea of leadership like Mm -hmm. in practice what does that look like um you know, like you're right. They have, you know, Google home or Alexa sitting there. They have an iPhone, they have Wikipedia, they have YouTube, you know, how do you lead them and what type of relationships, trust, confidence that you as a parent and educator, do you need to show to them? Are there like tips and tricks you can give us on being better leaders in a homeschool or learning environment? Well, I I mean, I think if you can anticipate uh, problems or or emotional reactions before they occur and predict them for the child, help a child to label something that might happen so that they're like, oh, wow, wait a second. They they really understand me. They really, how did you know that that's what was going to happen? I think that's one thing. I think finding and taking advantage of opportunities where your child wants you to be in the, in the lead, like bedtime routines are a great one. There's quiet time. That's a time when kids are often willing to be a little bit more vulnerable, might be a little bit scary for them at bedtime uh, and really um, leaning into those kind of routines where you're, you're sort of, you're the, you're their guide so to speak, right? Not necessarily the one who's bossing them around and telling them what to do all the time, but you're their guide. They're following your lead. uh, In you know, when kids are sick and their parents are providing, you know, some support and help. uh, If, if my son has a cold or something, uh, he wants his mom to, to make him this certain meal that he he's 18 and he still wants that. Uh, and, and I'm almost she, 40 and I still want you know, what my mom made when I was sick. Yeah. Well, do you see, now I, I think that's so important. Uh, and we need to recognize what the kids are looking for in, in that, uh, in those times, which is they want that security. They want to know that someone is going to look out for them when they need it. Uh, and we see, I, I mean, I see, lots of kids in the work that I do who, who don't feel comfortable putting that trust in the adults who are there to care for them. This is so interesting. I are. Yeah. Because we've, we've been doing a lot of quiet time lately. Yeah. Um, we've been instituting quiet time as our six-year-old has, you know, given up the nap uh, in the last mm. year or so her afternoon mm. nap um, being able to focus into quiet time. Um, has been a big thing for us in the afternoon, yeah. you know, doing Legos, doing audiobooks, things of that nature, where she has time to explore and think and play, you know, kind of by herself and, and kind of have that stimulation there. Um, you know, that has been a big thing for us. It has been as she gets older, it's a challenge, you know, when they're, when they're preschoolers and uh, toddlers, there's, you know, we can just, we can cuddle with them and that that's like enough to get them to open up at it's, it's mm-hmm. very timely that we're having this conversation with you because our daughter is currently upstairs in her room, having quiet time after <laughs> completely shutting down this morning and not being willing to do any homeschool and yeah. being very disrespectful about it. And I was, I was just upstairs before we sat down with you trying to get her to like open up and talk about it. And the, the, the skills that I would use on a preschooler don't really work with my kindergartner now because she's mm-hmm. older. I can't just cuddle up with her and get her to, you know, spill all her thoughts. Mm -hmm. Um, it's so it's, I I think the real challenge is, is this evolution while we, as parents, I I feel like we stay static, although we learn all the time and we grow all the Mm -hmm. time, our kids especially grow all the time Mm -hmm. and things change so quickly. 
um, what kind of advice um, would you have to help get kids to open up and, and, and give you an insight? I, I feel like sometimes we can't solve the problem because we don't know what the, what's going on in, in her brain and to try to like drag it out. <laughs> yeah. That, I, and that is a really tough one. Uh, one Im- important thing, I think, in helping to to make sure, f- you know, to to make it as easy as possible for kids to open up, especially about their feelings, is to talk about feelings often, even outside of their own feelings. Talk about feelings of characters in books that you're reading or TV shows or movies that depersonalizes it as well. But you also want to talk about those feelings in ways that are accepting. Because once you start getting into good feelings and bad feelings, it becomes less comfortable for kids, especially young kids. You're talking about, you know, a a kindergarten age child. It's it's they're still pretty all or nothing at that point. And if they're having feelings that are bad, they don't really it's it would be really tough for a five or a six year old to separate out a bad feeling from being a bad person. And they don't want to be the bad kid. So you you talk about. I know I'm, I've taken a lot of courses from a psychologist by the name of Gordon Newfeld, who's a, he's a Canadian guy out on the West Coast, and he he um, he really is careful about how he labels feelings, and he doesn't even he he won't say anxiety. He calls it alarm because it's your natural reaction when something scary or alarming happens. Your body's alarm system goes off, and so of course you feel uncomfortable in those situations but you need to pay attention to that because it's telling you something important it's telling you something that's important uh so i really like gordon's approach because it's it's all about the information that you're getting from your feelings so they're all good they don't always feel great but it's important to pay attention to them because they're giving you something uh the other thing that often parents need to do to help their kids to open up is that um and it's part of taking the lead too Uh, you may not want to ask too much how your kids feel about certain situations. You may instead want to tell them how they feel, how you think they feel. And if the good news is, if you're, if you're right or close to the target, you're giving them the language to talk about it and helping them understand what they're going through. If you're wrong, they'll tell you. And Mm -hmm. then you've got more information, right? They'll say, no way. That's not what it's like. It's because of this. And Mm -hmm. and this is how I'm feeling right now. Uh, and it's great when when you're able to do that. You know, as a psychologist who works with kids, and I've been doing this for, I hate to say, over 20 years, I get to <laughs> say things like, you know, oh, lots of kids in that situation would probably feel like this. Hmm. <laughs> Having met with thousands of kids, I could say, you know what, I've met with somebody who I, re- I remember when when he was in a situation like that, he said, this is how he felt about it. And sometimes you get, oh, oh, really? Somebody else would feel that way? Oh, you mean it's that's a normal reaction? Uh, I, I've had some kids who, who are surprised to learn that other children sometimes feel worried about things because people don't talk about that stuff. So, so, so important to talk about it. And you really do need to help kids to label those. First, help them to, uh, to accept and, re- and, and understand that their feelings are normal and helping them to label them so, so important in, in getting them to open up with some kids. I draw thermometers with numbers from one to five, and we do a five point scale to, to help them to kind of develop a shared language for me to understand their feelings, uh, which is really great for kids who are black and white or all or nothing. Cause all of a sudden they're learning that, Oh, it's not just a zero or a five. Like you could be at a three and they have a really hard time explaining what it would be like to be a little bit of something instead of totally overwhelmed. Does it help to, to put ourselves in our kids' shoes? You know, could I say to my daughter, gosh, if I was presented with something that I really didn't like, and I struggled with, this is how I would probably feel about it. And like, give them some sort of, um, you know, a tacit acceptance by association that, well, if mom would feel frustrated, then it's mm-hmm. okay that I'm feeling frustrated. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You're then you're normalizing it, which is exactly what you need to do. Because if the, if a child feels like there's something wrong with them because they feel a certain way about something, because mm. I, I don't know, because they're, they're crying when you drop them off at school, 
that, I mean, that's, I mean, we're talking about homeschooling, I know, but uh, that's sort of a common problem when you're a psychologist who works in a school board is that sometimes kids in, in the first week of school have a really hard time making that adjustment to being dropped off and being separated from their parents. And you're by normalizing their reaction, of course, that feels sad. Of course, you might feel frustrated. Frustration is another good one. I, 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 frustration is one of those primary emotions, I think. It's the natural reaction when things aren't working for you. When something's not working, you feel frustrated. And it's, it's easier to be empathetic with the frustration than it is to take a child's side when they're angry because anger is frustration plus blame. They're saying, this isn't working for me and it's your fault. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's hard to be empathetic about that. But, you know, then you wind up taking one sibling's side against another or, or you know, you're, there's, there's all kinds of reasons why I think it's tough to kind of be on side with anger. Uh, and instead, I think you want to be on side with the frustration, which is that really did not work the way you wanted it to. Oh. That is so frustrating when that happens. You're giving them the language. You're letting them know it's normal. You're letting them know, you know, you may be letting them know that you've felt that way in the past. Uh, you're, you're letting them know that you empathize with them and you understand what they're going through and that it's okay to feel that way. You might, you know, outside of the situation when they're emotional, try to find ways for them to kind of burn off that, that frustration related energy that, that don't get them into trouble. Because when kids do things that get them into trouble with their teachers or their parents, that, that increases stress. Like that's a source of separation anxiety, which is a huge stressor for kids. Interesting. Yeah, no, I, I've, Brian, you take Venmo, right? I feel like we're getting a lot of uh, right. teaching right now. We're, we're going through some. Okay. We're going Listen, through some, I, we're going, I used to do, yeah. I used to do a podcast about this stuff, you know, and, and we, we had a disclaimer at the beginning of every episode. I'm a psychologist, yeah. but I'm not your psychologist. <laughs> if you need help with something, you know, talk no, to your doctor well, and get a referral. No, no, I, I, I appreciate it though, yeah, because, talking through this. you know, part of, part of this for me, I, I, I had severe anxiety in the past and have had a lot of meetings with psychologists and things and completely respect and and don't feel that en enough people understand how helpful it is and so I, I I really appreciate you talking and and with us and I think that hopefully this will help maybe some other parents who you know aren't sure whether they should maybe see someone with their kids mm -hmm. one of the things personally from from my background of having so much anxiety and I come from a family who all has severe anxiety uh, my parents and grandparents and everybody so I'm hyper focused on that. You know, when you said at the beginning that one of the biggest problems you're dealing with is anxiety now in, in kids, and especially right now with COVID, everything's crazy. But I, I see that more and more, even with the other kids on the street that are going to school, this ramp up in anxiety. Mm -hmm. And I do start to see like hints of it in our own daughter where, you know, she's, she's having an anxious or alarm reaction to something. Um, what advice can do you have for us if we start seeing that happen with our kids? Because I know that the longer that goes on, if you don't learn how to uh, accept and deal with your body's alarm system, mm -hmm. it, it mm -hmm. can build and grow into just a paralyzing fear. And I, I have this, I have this, my own paralyzing fear that this is going to happen to, mm -hmm. to our kids because of my family background. And, but I know it's happening to a lot of kids. A lot of kids are feeling anxious. What are, what is your advice for, for heading that off at the pass and helping give our kids the, the, the tools and to, to cope with that feeling and, and deal with it? I, I think that predictability is really important. Unpredictability, not knowing what's going to happen next from one day to the, to, to the next. Uh, the pandemic has made this really stressful because we don't know, like you can't make long-term plans. You, you can't say for sure that you're going to be able to go to this event or that activity because who knows, everything might get shut down. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that's sort of what's been happening. So I think the more you can create an environment that's stable and as predictable as you can make it. And when things aren't predictable and when things aren't stable, kids need lots of extra reminders about the things that don't change no matter what, that they always have a mom and dad who care about them, uh, that they're a part of a family and that you've got a roof over your head and they're, you know, whatever that is, you look for the things that, that are always going to stay the same and kids need to kind of have those in front of mind 
to offset or balance out their worries about the unpredictability in the world. Um, I like, uh, you know, I often recommend family calendars as something where kids can see what's coming up next and, and that makes your, your life predictable. Most of the, the manuals that I've read about helping people to deal with anxiety include keeping a schedule and making, you know, checklists of things that are going to happen as a, as a good coping strategy. You, you, I think, um, might also need to recognize that rituals are important too, whether it's, uh, you know, visiting a, a religious service or, or something like that on the weekends, or it's family meals together. Uh, there was a study a while ago that indicated it did not matter what the activities were, but the number of traditions that a family had related to an important holiday was associated with a reduction in the risk for depression and anxiety, hmm. which wow, to me is such a big indicator of the importance of, uh, of predictability, of, of feeling like things go on things, you know, I know what's going to happen next. And my life is, uh, I, I understand my life because I, I know what's happening and what's <laughs> going to happen. Uh, so I think those things are important. I, I think that, that families also, uh, probably need to recognize that young kids do not have the ability to entertain two opposing thoughts or feelings at the same time. And that can make emotions hard. A toddler. Yeah, we, yeah, we saw that in the movie Inside Out, right? Where they oh, kind of, yes. they, they kind of explain that a little bit about how the, the emotions blend as they get older. Yeah. I, I went into that movie I was a bit apprehensive. I wasn't sure what they were going to say about emotions, but I thought it was fantastic. And I would definitely okay. recommend that to any parent who wants to understand uh, something about feelings. I, I think that the folks they had consulting on that movie were uh, really knowledgeable about what they were talking about. Uh, okay. And in terms of brain development, it's only for typically developing kids who haven't experienced trauma or major losses or who, who don't have learning problems that would make school extra stressful, et cetera, et cetera. But in ideal circumstances for typically developing kids, it's only between the ages of five and seven where they can have two feelings at the same time, which would allow them to have courage, for example, when they feel stressed about something or to persevere on something that's frustrating. A four-year-old can't sit down to something that's really hard and say, this is hard for me, but I'm going to keep doing it because, you know, I care about what mom thinks, or I don't want to get in trouble, or I really want to learn how to do this. No, it's usually all or nothing for toddlers and preschoolers. And it's not until they get up into those early elementary years where, where they can have those two feelings at the same time and be courageous or, or show some grit or perseverance or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, be able to control their reactions to frustrations when, you know, you, you won't hear too many three-year-olds say, I feel like throwing this right now. They just throw it. Right. But a six-year-old yeah. can say, Oh, I want to throw this right now. And they're stopping <laughs> themselves from doing it because they don't want to break it or they don't want to get in trouble or they don't want to hurt someone's feelings or they don't want to injure somebody. Those are two opposing feelings at the same time. And that's, that's how emotional regulation develops. And so between five and seven is when that process starts to occur. And hopefully you, you, you can have opportunities to talk to kids about, Oh, sometimes you feel this way. And sometimes you feel that way. Sometimes, you, you know, you have, hugs in you for your brother and sometimes you have hits in you <laughs> i feel like i'm <laughs> quoting gordon newfeld throughout all of this nope. this talk uh and so so you you'll see that in in the later elementary school grades where kids can demonstrate that they feel one way and you know i'm looking forward to going to school but i'm nervous at the same time and then they start to lose that ability again in the teenage years when their feelings get big again and sort of the big feelings crowd out that other you know I always say kids lose their butts when they when they go into uh, high school. They they don't say but anymore. They uh, unless they're saying yeah, but which basically means no, you're totally wrong. Uh, they 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 lose their I feel like this but, and, and so <laughs> sometimes sometimes the kids think I'm talking about something completely different when I say that they lose their butts <laughs> as teenagers. But what I, what I mean is that they don't have second thoughts about things anymore. 
<laughs> that's that's funny. And, and that's really the, the way the way you describe those emotions, we have a two year old and an almost six year old. And we, we, the, when you were describing it, I, I was literally seeing everything you were saying. I've seen yeah. that in the last week. It's very funny. It's very funny. Um, so let's pivot a little bit into from you know a lot of this and maybe into the play. You know, could you talk a little bit maybe before we get into you, the games and gaming and and the importance of games? Talk about this. You know, in, in your field, the grounding of the literature on play and why it is so important and you know development childhood development both physical play and um you know uh, games and things of those natures you know is there there's really solid literature that says play is one of the most important things you can do when you're younger with the kids oh my goodness i mean it's it's important you can see it in all mammals it's important yeah. for development you name it like it's not just humans yeah. who who benefit yeah. from play uh so so there yes there's there's lots of literature on play it's a bit tricky because different studies will define play differently and it does make it hard without a universal definition of this is what play is. Uh, I do think of play as being especially important for kids in learning how to um, understand and work through some feelings and trying out some things in the, in the setting where it's safe and there's no consequences. Uh, that's the key, I think. If, if you're talking about play that's going to be helpful for development, it's, it's play that uh, isn't work. So there's no consequences for it. It's not real life. It, it's not something that's, you know, if you say the, the wrong thing to your mom or dad when you're playing, you're not going to get in trouble for it. Uh, it's, it that can be tough again with siblings, right? Sometimes yeah. it starts out as play and becomes something that's no longer play. And then you have to split them up and, and, uh, and uh, it, it moves out very quickly from. It moves very quickly from play to war. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> With the yeah two exactly. <laughs> exactly right. So yeah. So so there can be some imagination in it, and you can be trying on some new things or trying out some new skills. But but I think the fact that there aren't consequences and it's time limited can allow so many things to happen that don't happen uh, in real life. Uh, so you can practice things like, uh, you know, you you'll have kids who. Some, sometimes it's building and destruction play where you're just mm -hmm. piling up something and knocking it over and it, you're kind of working through some frustrations maybe. Sometimes it's you can see it in games where uh, kids might be reluctant to, I don't know, practice their math or do a worksheet in math. But all of a sudden, if you've got a game with math in it, they're you know counting up their Pokemon's hit points and <laughs> you know they're reading all those pokemon cards but they never wanted to read a book that was assigned at school so when it's play when there's no consequences when there's some imagination and it's time limited so if you do have a feeling about something it doesn't you, it's not going to suck you down into an abyss of feeling sad or grumpy or scared uh there's lots of lots of play involves fear hide and seek is a good one you're kind of hiding all by yourself and and you're waiting to be found um, so, so there's all kinds of, of different play that helps to work through emotions. And I think that, that, that stuff is super important. Uh, what I, what has happened, I think in society in general, and maybe especially with the pandemic is that it's not, it's really hard to feel playful when you're stressed. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think adults lose their playfulness and, that makes it hard to play with their kids. I'm just, I'm, I don't even know what to say. I'm like, this is just crashing over my brain, yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> just thinking about the times that, um, you know, as much as we love to play with our kids mm -hmm. when, you know, and they approach us sometimes where I'm like, play is the furthest thing from my mind. And it is times when I'm busy and I'm stressed yeah, and right. thinking about other things. And mm -hmm. uh, that's just, yeah, no, it's, it's hard. It's hard to rise up when you're tired or, you know, you've yeah. been in the office all day long to say, Hey, mommy, yeah. come on out and wrestle with me. It's like, yeah, I don't have the energy for that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but my, my mind is also not engaged in wanting to be playful. That doesn't sound mm -hmm. fun to me. Whereas on a Saturday morning, the idea of wrestling around sounds, sounds fun to me. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that's a really interesting. So if we see that stress in our kids, where they're, you know, not tending towards play, what things can we do to help re-engage them and in, in, in come back to play? Well, I, I mean, I think that parents, um, where they can, uh, should 
maybe help to take some of the responsibility or all of the responsibility uh, from the child uh, in terms of making things work. If you've got a child who's so stressed that they're no longer playful or, or that they're, uh, you're getting sort of a motivated distractibility where there's something that they're avoiding. So they need to be engaged in something all the time because quiet time is threatening for them. Uh, then it's, it's the parent's job, even if you don't know specifically what it is that's going on that's stressing them out, to do what you can to make things work and to help that child to feel some sense of security. And like I said, predictability, right? To have a, a, an environment where, um, where they can rest and, and feel like it's okay, it's gonna be okay. Uh, yeah. And that's where the play starts to come back. I mean, one of the reasons why I started recommending games is because there's like a, a rule set where you don't have to make up a play anymore. You can, you can play a game with the child and there's rules that you can read and this is how you do it. And you don't have to, to create something out of whole cloth every single time. It's like play with a, a low bar for entry. And because most parents are aware only of games like Monopoly or Risk that take hours to play and often end in a fight, uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, I like to recommend well games that are shorter because you can't be all or nothing, right? You can't, mm -hmm. you know, if if I'm not going to play with my kids until I have a whole morning to play with them, then it's not going to be very often that I get to play with my kids. So. Uh, if, if you can find a game that takes 15 minutes or half an hour to play um, right now, my kids are in university, so it's hard for them to set aside a whole afternoon to play something like, um, you know, I've, I've been excited about Concordia recently. Uh, so mm -hmm. I've been playing a lot of that, but uh, you know, finding something that takes 15 minutes is, is awesome for us because you can sort of be passing by and play around a crokinole and, then you just spent some time together and had some fun and had some trash talk and sort of, <laughs> you know, fooled around for 15 or 20 minutes. And then you can get off on, on the rest of your day, but you feel close. It, it, it brings, it brings you so close to your kids when you're able to find that playfulness. And we do, I mean, we do lose it. Uh, especially when we're stressed or busy or, and, and recognizing that, uh, recognizing that you don't want your kids to inadvertently misinterpret your lack of playfulness in a particular moment as a, a rejecting message. That is super, super important, I think, for parents to keep in mind. I remember a time when I was at a, uh, a, a presentation. It was an awards gala at my son's uh, junior high school. So he was in middle school at that point. And his younger brother was with us and we're sitting on these hard cafeteria chairs going through presentation after presentation. And my little boy wanted to sit on my lap and which I didn't mind. Uh, he sat on my lap, but it, those chairs were so painful and I had to have him sit beside me. So I was, he was being an angel at this thing, supporting his brother. He wanted to sit on his dad's lap and I'm saying, Oh buddy, no, you can't, you can't, you can't. And I get out of there like, I've just spent the last 45 minutes where he was being a, an angel, um, rejecting him and pushing him away. So mm -hmm. I had, I, I consciously made an effort to, to, well, first, you know, at, during the bedtime routines, explain to him, well, it wasn't about rejection. It was just, oh my goodness, those chairs were hard. And it was, and I was really sore in that moment, but I'm giving you extra cuddle time now because, right. So mm -hmm. uh, that consciousness allows you to compensate for those times when you may have felt less playful or you just didn't have time. So for families that aren't familiar with the, the wealth of tabletop games that are available now and, and, and are only used to fighting over who's taken who out of Monopoly, um, how do you how do you start to introduce it to them? What are some of the maybe initial games you recommend to them, or how do you, how do you recommend they jump into this world? Because, I mean, they could they could sit down and you know buy something that's even more contentious than Monopoly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, in in there's there's such a wealth of what's available for for parents and for kids. How do you how do you steer people and kind of give them the tools they need to to jump in and use games to to connect with their kids? 
uh, it can be a challenge, right? Um, because uh, especially for parents who aren't really familiar with all of the uh, the explosion of tabletop games that that has has happened over the last few years, uh, it it can be intimidating. Um, I, I've worked with lots of adults who are like, "Oh, you're going to ask me to read this big rule book and explain, and then teach it to my <laughs> child." Oh, that's a that's a challenge. So uh, I. I sometimes do provide resources like, uh, you know, watch it play videos and things like that so that they can watch a video first. So they sort of have the gist before they sit down to look more, more uh, in depth at, at rules. Um, you want, I think you want to start with something that's simple and fun, and usually funny. Um, there's, uh, I, I think laughing with your kids is very powerful and uh, games that elicit that are uh, really important, <laughs> I think. Uh, so, but but games are uh, are like music. You you can't just go into a music store and pick any old record and you're going to like it. Um, you've you've got to tailor those recommendations to the person that you're working with. What other things do they like to do? What kinds of video games do they play? Or stories do they like? If you're watching mm -hmm. a show on TV, what kinds of shows do they gravitate towards? Do they like animals or you know, and, and you can get some information about a theme that they that they might like. Uh, are there games that are universally loved? I, I, there are some that are very popular and, and are enjoyed by most people, but um, everyone's different, right? Like my, I had one kid who loved and still to this day loves dexterity games and cannot get enough of them. And his brother is like, forget about it. I don't want to play those. Um, because he's you know he, he it's not his favorite thing because he's less skilled at it but once you know once he sat once he sits down to play them and we can have some laughs about it and now sometimes he's old enough he can beat his dad it's a little bit more fun um so yeah you, you do tailor your recommendations because i'm doing so many of these psychoeducational assessments where uh, i'm working with kids who have some skills deficits that might be interfering with their learning uh, i might recommend games that are fun but allow the child to to practice a skill while still having fun uh, if it's a skill that maybe they're sensitive about or that they feel like they're lacking um so that might i mean for kids who are having trouble with fine motor skills i might recommend a game like rhino hero um, which is a great dexterity game but you've got you know a, a rhinoceros superhero and colorful artwork and uh you know it and because in, unlike jenga where you've got these blocks of wood that fall down and make a loud clattering sound if somebody's anxious or sensitive to noise you're building a tower of cards in rhino hero so it works a lot better mm -hmm. Uh, for those <laughs> kinds of things. So, I mean, it depends on the situation. I will say I do recommend uh, uh, Rhino Hero often just because it's easy and fun and, and bright and colorful and everyone can understand it. Um, that's a, a good entry level kind of a game. But sometimes it's word games. Uh, I've, I've really had good reactions to um, simply wordy is one that uh, people I've talked with or played with have, have found that to be quite an enjoyable one, but it's more of a spelling game. So you, you sort of have to uh, be working with a kid who's old enough to know some vocabulary words and be able to put letters together to make those words. Uh, so it, you know, it really, it depends on the family. I'll, I'll, I'll talk to them in depth about this stuff and see if I can find a mechanism that they might like or a theme that they might like. And, and we go from there. Sometimes it's just the components. I, I like games that have a real tactile quality to them or beautiful artwork. Um, I, I think that those, it just makes it fun to have it on the table and you're more likely to play those games. If, if, if you like looking at them or touching the pieces or, or moving those things around. So, so you're, you're, you're talking a lot about games and people are starting to wonder, you know, why are you such an expert in games? Can you talk to us a little bit about brains on games and what you're doing with that? Sure. Sure. Well, I mean, I have been a game player since I was very small. Uh, I remember playing mousetrap was one that still sticks out in my mind to this day, building that contraption 
and, uh, and then not tra- playing the game, and then just the- just triggering the contraption. No, nope. yeah. usually right. I would play with that toy. Uh, I mean, it was great, yeah. but it was a building thing, and there was a game yeah. to it. And sometimes we would play it, but it was a nice machine to play with. Yeah. I played exactly. tabletop role playing games as I went up to high, to the high school level, uh, and really enjoyed getting together with friends and creating a story uh, in that way. I think I. I was kind of a creative writing type of a kid and a, and a drama club kind of a kid. So those role-playing games were fantastic and fun for me. Uh, and it was only, um, I, I kind of got away from games once my kids were born because, well, from being so busy, my first, my first son was born, um, while I was still working on my license to become a psychologist. Uh, so I had an encyclopedia of books to study and I was super, super busy all the time. So I wasn't playing games. I was studying all the time and preparing for tests and getting used to a new job. Uh, and it was only later when I was trying to find ways to get them away from the technology primarily, like screens are such a huge thing now. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think lots of parents kind of find themselves walking a tightrope between providing the screen time that allows their kids to know what all their friends are talking about in the classroom. So they're not totally the odd one out (laughs) and uh, limiting that screen time so that they can, so they're not totally relying on virtual accomplishments to find their self-worth. But screen time was a common thing that was people were coming into my office and saying, well, how do I get them away? How do I get them away from their screens? And I started saying, well, you know, you, I wouldn't recommend that a parent says, turn that off and find something to do. I would instead suggest that a parent says, let's turn that off and come with me and let's do something together. So what, <laughs> then what do you do? Well, I did feel like board games were kind of a lateral transition from video games or whatever else the kids were doing on their screens. And that's sort of how it started for me. I started finding some, some games that, that, um, were appealing in some way. The Duke was, I don't know where I found that, but I, I think it was at a, at a, a comic convention or something that I brought the kids to. I learned about the Duke and that was a huge one, a game that's sort of like chess, but it adds some random elements to it. And it's just a neat game. Uh, and once, once that door started to open for, for me, I started to find games that I could recommend to parents and become almost like an encyclopedia of games. Now, Brains on Games didn't start until, well, I, I mean, my pra- I've, I've been practicing as a psychologist for many years, but doing these assessments, I would recommend to parents either to limit screen time or to practice a skill through play that a child needs to develop, I would recommend a game. Uh, it might be, like I said, a game like Rhino Hero or uh, it might be a game like, um, I'm trying to think of another one that relies on memory, like a memory matching game for kids who need to practice sure. that visual memory skill. Sure. Uh, and so I've been recommending, almost prescribing, I guess you might say, board games and card games to families for ages. And then I had to close my office because of the pandemic. So my practice, because my practice focuses on assessments, you have to do those in person. So I had a few counseling cases that continued virtually through teleconferencing but my office was basically closed for three months uh and i found myself becoming stressed uh because i'm you know i was used to working six days a week and then you know spending time driving the kids to soccer games and things like that but everything stopped uh and and i i was looking for something that was sort of work related but also creative that i could throw myself into uh, and I, I had been thinking for a while about maybe putting up YouTube videos to help share games with families or to introduce games to families that they could try out with their kids. Uh, lots of people already do that, but what can a psychologist who does psychological assessments add, I guess, that other people don't do is to talk about the skills that are practiced by playing whatever the game is. So I always link back the the gameplay in those videos that I'm doing, I link it back to the skills that I that that I measure in an assessment. So brains on games started out of um, uh, an unpredictable world in a pandemic, uh, <laughs> and a psychologist who had a lot of time on his hands and started to go maybe a little bit stir crazy himself because there was absolutely nothing to do, uh, and it was sort of an idea that had been germinating in the back of my mind to help parents. Um, 
learn about uh, games that that maybe they wouldn't have knew about otherwise. Great. Well, no, it's great. Yeah, we, our podcast started during the pandemic, and we've been uh, game schooling for a number of years now. Um, yeah. and that's been a big thing for us. Um, you know, embracing games as a centerpiece. We, I think, every week we do a game review on we our try podcast. Try to yeah. anyway. It's been a little bit, but mm-hmm. I have a game ship coming in tomorrow. Yeah. Don't be mad. I know. Uh, I know. And um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So, and we we love your videos. They're so well done. So we'll link brains on games here. And I I. I don't want to take up any more of your time. Yeah, you've been very generous. Thank you so much. This has been just, uh, I have a lot to think about as I go back upstairs and talk to our daughter today uh, after this interview. (laughs) I have a a lot of food for thought. So thank you for that and, and, and for your time. My pleasure. Thanks so much for having me on. It was a lot of fun. Thanks so much for joining us today and making us a part of your homeschool journey. Please engage with us on social media. Join our Homeschool Together podcast group on Facebook and find us at Homeschool Together podcast on Instagram. We'd love to hear your feedback, questions, and recommendations. Until next time. Happy homeschooling!